My name's Connor Pope. I'm Deputy Editor here at Progress. I'd like to thank you all again for being here today. I was lucky enough to spend quite a bit of time campaigning for our next speaker, Alison McGovern, in rural south during the election. It's always a great experience, I think, to spend time with an MP who clearly cares so much about the community that they represent and to see how that community recognises and responds to that. I remember one day we were uh, to be joined in a canvassing session by a journalist from a local paper. Uh, we were meeting at the New Ferry River Park, which, after a long campaign led by Alison, had turned from a wasteland into this beautiful public space with views overlooking the Mersey. And as we were waiting at the gates, there was a, a mother walking in with her daughter, who was about six or seven years old. And the mum came up to us and she said, I've been explaining all about the election to my daughter, and she's been counting all of your posters around town. Alison said, that's fantastic. And how many have you counted? And the little girl said, 61. She said, 61, that's fantastic. And have you been counting the posters for the other people who want to be the MP as well? And the little girl looked at her incredulously and said, there are others? <laughs> and I said to her mum, here's 20 pounds. Come back in five minutes when the journalist is here and get her to say it again. <laughs> And friends, it was just as convincing the second time. <laughs> In fact, Alison's popularity was so great that her Tory opponent told that same local paper on camera, a lot of people say to me, I love having Alison McGovern as my local MP. Perhaps it shouldn't have come as a surprise that he didn't win. But I was as shocked that Alison managed to increase her majority by almost 4,000 votes. I know that I wasn't the only person who didn't see it coming, and I know that it is easy allow, to allow the shock to shape your beliefs and make you question everything that you thought you knew about politics. But there are two things from this election that have kept me steady. The first is the way in which the debate within the parties moved. It is now about how we win next time. That should give us heart, because that is where our focus always is. It's on electability and taking the country with us into power. Too often, these discussions have been absent within the Labour Party. We should welcome that they are now central to the debate about our future. The second is something that Alison said to the hundreds of activists who came to her campaign launch back in early May. It really stuck with me. She said, you're not here for me. You're here because you believe in one simple and true thing, that all of us are better off when we are all OK. You're not here because of an individual, but because of a set of beliefs that says our community is strongest when we are all included. That is what we are here for, and that is what the Labour Party is for. I think that's absolutely right, and I think it's really worth remembering. The party is about more than any one of us. That is what Alison is so good at, throughout not just the party or progress, but throughout politics. She's gained a reputation as one of the best MPs of the past 10 years one of the sharpest economic minds in Parliament, one of the best writers, and most of all, someone who's able to reach out far beyond her own tradition, her own ideas and background, to welcome others into politics. That really is a talent that we desperately need more of. And it is one that I've seen up close, working at Progress and campaigning for in the rural. So I'm pleased to welcome to the stage, Chair of Progress, Alison McGovern. Never know when you get an introduction like that it's always just a massive risk thank you so much Connor um, getting applause is is lovely but um, I feel like we all have a hard job to do ahead getting into government now but I have absolutely no doubt that that role would be uh, a lot harder if it wasn't for the people who work for progress who've put this conference on today not just Connor, who is brilliant, but also um, the whole team who do an incredibly difficult and occasionally thankless task. So I would just ask you, before I say anything further, would you join me in thanking the whole Progress team for... Thank you.
you know, in, in, in politics, lots of people want to do the easy things. Not so many people do so well at doing the hard things, and I'm very grateful to them all. But first, um, I want to start my speech by talking about one of those uh, progress team members. I want to talk about Richard Angel. Don't we all? It's <laughs> what you're thinking. Now, I don't always find it easy to describe exactly what I stand for. But when I heard Richard's words after the terrible terrorist attack on London Bridge, I knew that he had defined not just what I believe, but the principles of progress. He said, if me having a gin and tonic with my friends, flirting with handsome men, and hanging out with brilliant women is what offends these people so very much, I'm going to do it more, not less. <laughs> and the first thing I thought was, me too. And the second thing I thought was, Richard, your defiance in the face of terror, your celebration of diversity in the face of deep prejudice, and primarily your spirited defense of British values, where happiness and a spectacular love of life will always triumph against a twisted death cult. That reminds us all who we are and where we belong. And that is what progress means, a country where everyone can express their love and their kindness. And if we didn't know it before recent months, we can see it now. This is our country, full of British love and British kindness. Richard, we salute you. You and everyone who has defied terror. You didn't just experience an awful attack and defend yourself. You changed the terms of the debate. No somber tones, but loud and clear pride in who we are. And speaking of pride, when it comes to fighting elections recently, progress is second to none. Our members were out in hundreds of seats across the country during the election. And look at the results. We held vital seats like Ashfield, Dudley, Barrow and Furness, Wes Streeting in Ilford North. Labour majority, 10,000. Peter Kyle. <laughs> Peter Kyle in Hove, get ready for it. Labour majority, 18,000. <laughs> That, that is what happens when the Labour family comes together, old members and new, enthusiasm and experience coming from every direction, and we campaigned together, we learned from each other, and we picked a fight with the Tories. And millions of people in our country voted for an optimistic agenda and proved that Britain is not the mean, insular, afraid country that some believed we were. Now, I know you've been discussing the election all morning, so I don't want to um, go on about it any further except to say that it is true that as my predecessor as Progress Chair, John Woodcock, has said, we would not have got over the line without the way Jeremy Corbyn inspired young people and some former non-voters to get active and vote Labour. But it's also true that as we gained Kensington and Canterbury, we lost Mansfield and Middlesbrough. Our vote increased massively in places like Brighton and Reading, but our majorities were slashed in much of Yorkshire and the East Midlands, and we should take our time to understand that. But whatever the analysis, I believe in experiencing this election, what I felt was the strength of Labour values. Across our movement, people joined together in the campaign. As Connor put it, not just because they had a belief about one individual, but that they came because they believed something straightforward. They thought that the Tory government since 2010 has left far too many people in our country out. It has been brutal to those who needed help and a complete disaster for people who are not already wealthy or already privileged. That is what I think at present can be understood from the election, but now we must move on. Our eyes must be on our country and what the Tories are doing to it. Because, friends, scores of people are dead. They are dead in a housing block run by the state, by the government. Their families are suffering a heartbreak from which I know they will never recover. And thousands more across the country are wondering if there's enough police to keep them safe. Hundreds of thousands of people are stretched to breaking point financially. And millions of people in Britain are having to face 
the fact that if they fall and break a limb, there may not be an ambulance to come and get them. Our country is brave, but there is much to fear. But let me focus on the Grenfell fire for just a moment, because I believe that there is a fundamental problem in our country about which people get heard. I will explain. Rich people also live in tall buildings. Plenty of them do. So why are those buildings safe and Grenfell House not safe? Here in London, there are tall buildings all around us. But which are the ones that are most likely to be unsafe? Those where people on low incomes live. Now, just try getting a fire door fixed if your council has chosen not to prioritise the housing maintenance for your tower block, but instead already has given a tax cut to wealthy people. A Tory council handing back money to the richest residents. That's the reality. While Labour councillors are doing their best to help, and Labour councils deal with the worst of the cuts. And the thing is, these Tories never hear the voice of those they look down on. People are disregarded because they have less money, less influence, less power. Put the state in the hands of politicians who are willfully negligent to the fortunes of those unlike themselves, and these are the disasters that ensue. This horrific episode in the history of social housing scars us all, and to me, it reeks of the worst of Britain. It's painfully evident that a group of people who should have been listened to were not. Worse still, I saw with my own eyes in the Southwark Council ward I used to represent what I believe should have been the warning sign that stopped the Grenfell Tower fire. In 2009, when Lachanel House burnt, six people died. Three women and three children, two who were mothers and one a three-week-old girl. I cannot forget them. And eight years on, many more women, many more men, and many more children are dead. So how did those deaths in Camberwell fail to stop more deaths in Kensington? We don't know the whole answer yet, but what we do know is what has happened to the state between 2009 and today. We know that the Tory government has too often turned away from those who needed it and not towards them. There are 4,000 more children living in poverty since 2010. There are 100,000 pensioners who now cannot make ends meet. And rough sleeping is up 133%. All of this while the economy stalls, wages are flat, debt is spiralling, and deficit targets are met year after year after year. That is what a Conservative government does. And if you feel within me, in you, like I feel within me, the burn of frustration and the hot tears of anger, you are right to. I think we should all be angry now. So forgive me if my focus today isn't on Labour issues. Our attention must be reserved for the Tory government and how we defeat it. Just for a second, let's remind ourselves of what the Tories before the election had planned for our country. No reversal of the inheritance tax cuts for the richest, but a cut of 7% uh, spending in our schools. Corporation tax down again to 17%, but thousands of NHS nurses struggling without a pay rise and keeping a £3 billion cut work allowances, which will mean child poverty set to rise a further 1.2 million in the next five years. And that was the future that Theresa May had mapped out for Britain. But we couldn't stand for it. We couldn't live with it, so we fought back. And whilst we did not win, we have stopped the Tories in their tracks. Millions of people voted Labour, and because of those votes, the Tory plan to take our education system back to before the 1970s with new grammar schools won't happen. Because of those votes and because of our efforts, the poorest children in our country will not have free school meals taken away from them. And because of those votes and because of our efforts, their plan, their ludicrous plan, to even bring back barbaric fox hunting will not happen. During the election, and now with the Grenfell Tower Block fire, we have seen real and furious anger at Theresa May. And I want to talk today about why. The root cause. I think she's arrogant. I think Theresa May assumes she is entitled to power. She thought she was entitled to a huge majority and that all she had to do to get it was to just turn up on polling day. 
Well, unlucky for her. And doesn't that just show you should never underestimate the Labour Party? But her arrogance is not just a cause of woe to the Tories. It's a cause of woe for all of us, because in Britain, every town, in every town in Britain, the story is the same. Hardship, fewer teachers, fewer police. Across the world, our standing, our reputation for acting in the common interest and the common good has been ruined. It's been trashed by a Tory party that has finally given in to the anti-Europe mania that has obsessed the hard right sect that it has harboured for too long. The root cause of it, then, is that the Tories are just blind to the lives of anyone but themselves. They're arrogant. And the woman who named their disease the nasty party has reinfected the patient. So how do we respond? Our eyes must be on the present because our country is hurting. The state has been left threadbare and people are falling every day with no one to pick them up. So I tell you, their arrogance can no longer stand unchallenged. It cannot stand. It cannot stand. The Labour Party was created to stop this, created to fix it, and created to get people a voice and get them heard where power lies. We all came together in the end because we're the people who can't be happy when others are unhappy. We can't be comfortable when we know that others don't have the resources or the power to be themselves comfortable. And we came here because our success is defined by whether others, too, have a chance of success. Our Labour values are love. That's what they are. And we cannot sit idle if our love is a goal unfulfilled. So, we have an urgent job. There is no time to waste. And there are three things I think we must do, three campaigns in the weeks and months ahead. So I want to finish by talking about those three campaigns. First, public services. The all-out assault the Tories have launched on the state since 2010 has gone far enough. The school cuts must stop and we must campaign to make it happen. Our NHS staff have had a real terms pay cut year after year. They can't take it any longer. It's got to stop and we must make it happen. And unless we want to see child poverty worse, worse even than under Margaret Thatcher, the tax credit freeze must end too. These things can change. The Tories have no majority in Parliament anymore, thanks to everyone here. Right? In every budget, in every piece of legislation, there will be opportunities to make people's lives better. And Labour MPs will be there on the Commons benches and in those committees and those late night votes, and we need your support. Second, on Brexit. Let me be clear with everybody. In my view, there is no deal that is just like the single market, but not the single market. Leavers and Remainers alike want all of the prevaricating to stop. The only way to trade on the same terms as now is to stay in the single market. Leaving means curtailing our freedom. It means undermining our prosperity, and it means cutting off the funding for our public services. The best anti-austerity policy in this country today is remaining in the single market, and we must be the ones to fight for it. We know that out of the single market and with mi net migration cut to the tens of thousands, there would be billions less to spend on schools, hospitals, and policing. But for too long, we've allowed the forces of conservatism to blame immigration for every ill our country faces. But it is a lie. And it's always been a lie. And it's a lie that could cost us our place in the world's biggest trading bloc. Our country has been made strong by immigration, not weak. And it is no patriotism, no patriotism at all, to stir up fear and resentment by pretending otherwise. So here's the choice. Fight to stay in the single market, reform freedom of movement along with others, and then argue about the distribution of wealth in our country. Or crash out of the single market and fight about how to stop the absolute poorest in our country becoming destitute. Like it or not, that's the choice, and I know which side I'm on. Many in our party feel the same, and I would ask you all to join the campaign to keep Britain in the single market. The talks have already started, and the time... <laughs> the time for the courage of our convictions is now. 
it's time to remind those Tory Eurosceptics that their opinions are not the only ones that count. The government now, thanks to us, have no mandate for their vision of Brexit, and their weakness should be our strength. Third, and lastly, we must bring Britain back together. The people trying to divide our country do not speak for Britain. They never have, they never will, and we will not let them succeed. The last few years have certainly been turbulent for our country. It's a bit of an understatement. But the, last, the, but the response we have seen to the attacks of the few months are a powerful reminder of the instinct of the British people to look after each other. Call it blitz spirit. Call it keep calm and carry on. Call it more in common. We know who we are. When people have tried to divide us from each other, we have held each other all the tighter. But this unity must be worked at and we have to do more. We have been badly served by an arrogant government that has put party interest over national interest, stirring up division and resentment between unionists and nationalists, leavers and remainers, young and old, public and private, those born in this country and those who've come here more recently to work or to learn. Every time those Tories put party ahead of our country. But for us, as my friend Liz Kendall once said, the country always comes first. Now, now, we need to take on these divisions, and the people who are being left out must be heard, and we will be the people to make it happen. Britain doesn't want to be divided, and we should shout that loud and clear. It doesn't matter where you come from or what your name is. If you want it to be, Britain can be for you. That's why we, in our Labour family, Never for one moment assume we are entitled to power. We listen to people. We understand where they're coming from, and we put them first. This, in the end, is what the Labour Party is for, changing who gets to be heard. Not the arrogant, entitled, careless, dismissive Tories who exploit division and see only the privileged few, but the many in our country, the very many who just want better for us all, our job now is to change who gets to speak. Our job is to leave no one out and decide whose voice gets to speak for Britain. And when we do that, we will win. Thank you. That was fantastic, so thank you, Alison, and it's, um, it's always so... It's a great feeling, isn't it, to be in a room where Liz Kendall still gets a round of applause. <laughs> um, she does in my house. <laughs> uh, so we're going to move out to um, audience questions soon. I've got a couple of my own for Alison first, so if you do have a think about uh, any questions that you do want to ask and how you might phrase them as succinctly as possible so we can get through as many people as we can. Um, so, yeah, thank you, Alison, for that fantastic speech. I just want to pick up on a couple of the points, first of all, that you, you know, your three-pointed plan. And the first one was about public services. Mm -hmm. And I think that the debate around uh, the economy and how we fund public services has definitely shifted. And I think that is clear to see from this election. But I think perhaps there is still something in there about how the Labour Party not only owns that, but manages to gain back trust on the economy as we do it. And I think that's been a central debate that we've been having here for years, and it's still not something that we've kind of landed on. So I was just wondering if you had some thoughts about what direction we need to do to go in with that. So I've been reading Ed Balls' um, book recently. I don't know if anyone else has read it, but it's, 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 it's really good. And, um, and it's, written, um, it's written in the form of... Um, it's not like, I did this, I did that. It's written about different things that you need to know in politics. And it's supposed to be like a bit of an advice manual for politicians. So you can you know, draw your own conclusions as to why I've been reading it recently. <laughs> but um, one of the things that Ed says in it is, is something that he feels that he learned from Ken Clark, which is that, in the end, good economics is good politics. Because I think often people 
on, you know, sort of gaining uh, trust on the economy and talking about business and e economic issues. I think one of the pe things that people do is we try and, I mean, we had like cost of living crisis, which never really worked. And we try and kind of play the politics of it rather than just understanding the fundamental uh, movements in our economy and responding well to them in light of our values in the knowledge that good economics in the end is good politics. Which brings me to kind of Brexit and the single market, really. I mean, anyone who's a regular reader of Mark Carney's speeches will, <laughs> you, know, you can't <laughs> avoid this kind of like massive warning he's giving us. Um, about the and if you don't read them, actually, I've found. Right. So, <laughs> so definitely read them, because there's this huge warning sign for all of us um, in what, in what the, the governor of the Bank of England is saying about the harm that the current Tory Brexit mess will do our economy. Um, I'm incredibly worried about it. Many, many of my constituents um, work in industry where they make goods collaboratively with other people in Europe that are very successfully exported. And I'm very worried about the future of their, their um, working lives. So we the thing that we have to do is focus on, what, on how to improve our economy, how to deal with the Brexit situation to prevent risks and to maximize opportunities. And in the end, good economics will be good politics. And on, on the single market, we've already had some um, amazing uh, disagreements um, so far on, on how we go about approaching Brexit, and you said yourself that you know, staying in the single market is the best anti-austerity policy that there is. And this week I think you signed a letter with, was it 50 Labour MPs, about pushing to stay in the, in the single market. Um, are you the only 50 Labour MPs that think that? I think, are there more to get? Are there the kind of lots who are in leave seats who just won't go near it? Yeah, but, you know, I spoke to a lot of Leave voters in the election campaign. I mean, hands up all of those people who campaigned in the general election and spoke to somebody who voted Leave, right? Exactly. Most of us have, right? These are not... People who voted Leave are not a group of people apart. They're like members of our family in many cases. So I would have a conversation with them, and the main frustration is the prevarication that's gone on, the kind of mess that the Tories have got themselves into, whereas... Most people, I think, want us to do a deal to make it work. And so the first problem has been the attitude of the Tories, you know, kind of going over there, gung-ho, waving the Union Jack as if they can somehow boss people around, whereas actually recognising that the European Union is just a group of countries who choose to work together. So if we seem to be more like we wanted to work with people, that might get us a better deal. And the second problem is the fundamental thing that the Brexit lot told people they could have everything and in a deal situation in a negotiation any trade union negotiator will tell you you can never have any, anything everything you want so you have to prioritize and decide what's the most important thing to you, yourself and i think the simplest way for us to do that and to protect the jobs of my constituents and lots of people here and around the country is to say well you know let's stay in the single market that's broadly what a lot of the brexit campaigners suggested would happen anyway let's stay in the single market make it work and if we need to have reform, let's do it with other people and not sort of isolationist on our own. And I know that we, obviously we've spoken about this election so much already today and, and you kind of avoided it a bit in the speech because of that. But I think looking forward, we still need to understand it a bit in order to know where we are and, and where we're going next. And I don't mind being a bit of a misery guts about it. I used to work at H&M on Oxford Street and I was one of the few British people there and definitely the only kind of down and northern are there and all of the, how did you cope <laughs> and all of these kind of my european colleagues would ask me day after day you know how are you today i'd always go oh, not bad they go why do you always say not bad why are you never good <laughs> they kind of didn't understand that like oh, fine but we are in london does anybody need me to translate the kind of northern <laughs> chat <that's here? laughs> but that is kind of how i feel about this election it's like we didn't win it was like you know it was good but like can i do can i do my can i do my cheerful chirpy uh we're all scouse <laughs> attitude? Sure. because i'll be honest with you right when i walked into the house of commons the first day back and i could not find a seat on the labor benches because they were full my heart did a little skip and then 
uh, lovely Fiona, who, be who beat vile Stuart Jackson from Peterborough, gets up and asks a question. And she was phenomenal. And I like nearly had a little cry. I was so happy. So I just think the only response to the election that we can have is, of course, there were people who told us they didn't like Jeremy Corbyn very much. And we must listen to those people and understand where they were coming from. But if, in the end, we have got more Labour MPs and we are able to stop the Tories doing very bad things to our, our country, that is an excellent job of work done by everyone in this room. And that is a reason, even for you, Connor, to be happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I guess my, my, my still concern is that there is maybe uh, a level of expectation and complacency. Whereas if we still, if we replicated the Labour, uh, t Tory to Labour swing at the next election, we still wouldn't have a majority. And like, how do we make people realise that actually there is still a lot of work to do? We are still like quite a long way off actually being able to put our agenda into practice. Yeah, I think that's right. And elections are exhausting. But in the end, the only way to make people realise it is for us to go campaigning. I mean, um, I think everybody here will be hopefully already thinking about which is their next marginal. And, you know, my seat um, in Wirral South, we had lots of people coming from all over to come and help us. And we're now working out where we're going to go. You know, it's quite exciting, actually, not to kind of be the, not to be the marginal that everyone helps, but to be the pe people who are helping win the next marginal. So I think we just have to do the business of campaigning and that will get us through. This will be hard because, you know, there are difficulties out there for us. We've got um, a government that is quite unpredictable and we will have to respond to it and it might be difficult. But if in the end we stick together, I think we can you know, make real progress. Great. I think we can now open up to a few questions from the audience. I think we should have microphones going around somewhere. Um, great. If we come to uh, this man just down at the front here. Hi, um, my name is Josh from East Hampshire CLP. Um, millions of Labour voters um, voted to leave the EU. Um, and for me, a real risk is that if we commit to staying in the single market, we run the risk of disillusioning millions of Labour voters across our traditional heartlands. Um, don't you agree that if we do that, we run the risk of um, not gaining the next election, but actually losing seats across the board? Great. Uh, are there any other questions just at the moment? Okay, there's a young man over here. You'll be asking women, obviously. Sorry? You'll be asking women, obviously. I... <laughs> oh, we've got one at the back. We can go to the one at the back next. Uh, so I just wanted to quickly ask uh, a question about uh, f uh, free movement of labour. My name is Kuba. I'm um, uh, a young Fabian, secretary of the Young Fabians, and an EU migrant. Um, one of the things that, speaking around it during the referendum campaign and during this general election, was that a free movement was a massive issue for a lot of people um, in seats like Barking and Dagenham. Um, I just wanted to ask, how can we reconcile labor values, uh, traditional labor values, uh, and the values of the people that we seek to represent who do see an issue with uh, free movement of people? Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, Megan, one at the back there. Hi, my name is Rebecca, I'm from Staines. I think one of the things we forget is that one of the most important hinges of democracy is justice. Lots of people in the country have been denied justice because of cuts to legal aid. Let's not forget the Grenfell Tower victims were not going to get legal aid initially until the government finally promised it to them. How do we as a party bring justice back to the yeah. country? Brilliant. To dive straight in. I, I will. So, essentially, um, the, the first two questions are kind of about essentially, I guess, challenging me. Does my view about the single market and and um, the way that we should proceed risk alienating people who think that um, immigration is a problem? Well, you know, some some in uh, the public discussion about this would like to characterize my view as one that was in favor of um, you know, open borders regardless, uh, where pe anybody could come here if they wanted, and um, you know, negligent on security matters and other things. Well, that is just a kind of version of my view that is not true. 
Um, so when I talk to people about immigration concerns and they um, raise with me the issues that we've had um, over security, for example, quite honestly, I, sh I share their views. I represent a, an area um, that's quite close to a port and have several constituents who work for Border Force and I, and I know just what the, um, the Tory government has meant to them, which has been a real risk to all of our security. So we shouldn't be characterised as kind of um, being in favour of, you know, just open borders. We're not. And also, um, free movement has always been conditional anyway within the European Union. Um, there's, there's much more that we could do um, if we wanted to in Britain to um, tighten those rules and make the, the regulations of it clear. But it suits those who want to spin a narrative that immigration is the cause of every single ill in our society to pretend that that's not the case. And what I'm saying is, I won't give in to that because my family were immigrants. Lots of people here will have family or themselves be a migrant. And do we think it's a wrong thing to move countries to live the life that you want to? No. Do we think that when many years ago my family uh, came to this country from Ireland to prevent themselves starving and to have a decent life, did they do a wrong thing or a right thing? <coughs> Well, we think they did what perhaps anyone in their situation would do. So I I'm not going to be made to feel ashamed because I think that being an immigrant or immigration in general might make our country be better, not worse. And I think, of course, people will characterise my view as something that it's not, but I, I just think we should be robust on that. And, just, and I'll, be, I'll be completely honest in that I... Um, have spoken to lots of people in elections about immigration, lots, and you just have to, you have, to have a conversation with people. You can't be afraid of it, you can't pretend it's not happening, you have to have a conversation with people. But we also shouldn't allow our views to be defined by our political opponents. Just quickly, do you think yeah. staying in the single market means that you can, would it mean keeping the freedom of movement rules as they currently are, or do you think the idea that you know, reforming them is kind of a bit fanciful? Um, I think we just need to be clear what we mean by reform, because I think the first thing is what I just said, which is that there's, you know, there's plenty more that, that Britain could do by itself under the existing rules if it chose to. The second thing is, um, at the moment, in the continent of Europe, there has been ongoing for some time a migration crisis um, caused by the conflict in uh, Syria and North Africa and other places, and uh, exacerbated by the... By the internal debate that, that Europe has been having whilst it's not focusing on dealing with the consequences of that migration crisis. So the thing that I would like to see Britain do is show some leadership and talk to our European partners, specifically Italy and Greece, about how we get the right resources in place to help this crisis come to an end together. I mean, there is, there is very little that any one country can do on its own about this because in the end, you know, we live in an interconnected world these days. So we might as well face facts and get in there and show some leadership and try and help. Okay. And so on, on justice and, and legal aid, oh, how yes. do we... So, Rebecca, on, on legal aid, um, I mean, I would just essentially say I agree because this problem is having consequences that people can't perhaps see. A lot of the, the challenges that people might have brought on disability rights that have taken our country forward in years gone by now can't be done because of the lack of um, legal aid. You rightly point to the Grenfell disaster, and I know well the struggles of um, the families who lost loved ones at Hillsborough. And many of those struggles came down to lack of appropriate legal representation at the right time, and lack of resources compared to what the state had. So that is, that is absolutely, it must be a priority. Okay, we open up for a few more rounds of questions. Uh, if we could come to this woman over here first, please. My name is Charlotte. I live Tower Hamlet CLP, but I'm originally from Northern Ireland, which thankfully most of this country is now aware exists. <laughs> and the DUP has been in the news a lot, um, but most people only know about their social um, opinions. They're not actually aware that the DUP, the reason why it got so many votes in Northern Ireland is because it's a very working class party, very anti-austerity. And I just wonder, is 
Obviously, we cannot agree or accept many of the things they say, but is there a cause for Labour MPs to hold their noses, go to the DUP and tell them the Tories rely on you, push anti-austerity, if you do that, there will be cross-party support? Mm. Right, uh, and Grace, if, uh, if we could actually, Alex on the same road just here. Sorry, the woman just here with the glasses. Hi, um, my name's Alex, I'm from uh, Town Hamlets too. Um, one thing that Alison you mentioned was the lack of listening to the voices of the people that were living in Greenfell, that are, Grenfell that have been campaigning for a long time trying to get the council to listen to them. And something that's maybe been a bit lost during the general election campaign is that Labour actually had a really bad lot of council elections mm. um, just a few weeks beforehand. How can we carry the momentum um, and the engagement of young people that we seem to have gathered during the general election to make sure that in the next round of council elections, the next round of local elections, which is somewhere that Labour can make a huge difference under a Tory government, how do we make sure that we're getting our voices heard at the local level in the next couple of years? Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And uh, there was someone just, just down here at the front, please. Um, cheers, just, yeah. Thank you. Hi, I'm Hugh, I'm from Bosworth CLP. Um, when my friend and I came down today, we didn't tell really anyone in our CLP that we were coming. <laughs> um, it's all right, we won't tell them either, don't worry. And this is being broadcast on Facebook Live, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Give them a wave. I discovered Twitter today, I've blown my cover. Um, you've just added me, thank you very much. You had me earlier. Um, we didn't tell anyone we were coming, and when I uh, was agent in the last election um, and ran a local campaign rather than one based on the national leadership, I was called a traitor and I fully expect to lose my exec seat come our AGM. How do we keep being the voice of kind of progressive, moderate Labour in the party whilst not excluding those that have opinions other than our own? But how do we effectively survive now in our CLPs and keep yeah. being a voice when we're being pushed out? Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Shall we start on the DUP? Because yeah. you know Gordon Brown very well, and certainly there was talks in 2010, I think, about possible deals that could be done in the DUP. So maybe you know kind of a little bit about how those kind of talks came about and w what possibilities of uh, working with them arose through that? Um, well, I, I, mean, I understand perfectly well why people um, focus, um, and I think you mentioned it, um, Charlotte, why people focus on kind of the social <coughs> issues. Um, but, I mean, different parties have different views on those things and we all make our own view clear. But... I mean, Charlotte essentially asked the absolute right question, which is, if we've got a chance to put money in the pockets of people who need it in this country, and there's people who work with us to do it, why would we not try and work with them? And that, you know, that would be the approach that I imagine, although I haven't, um, I can't claim to have, sp strictly speaking, spoken to him about it, but that would be the approach that I imagine that, that Gordon would have taken then too, which is basically, what I was trying to do was in outlining in my speech was just to point out how bad things have got. And people will recognise it. You know, I can see plenty of local councillors in the room and people will recognise this. Um, anybody who's had a local council surgery, you know, in, in recent years will know those just faces of absolute despair as people are trying to make their life add up and it just won't. And there is a limit to what any local authority even a Labour one with the absolute best of intentions, there is a limit to what they can do. So quite honestly, if there's deals to be done on helping people who the Tories have not just neglected, but who've made their lives absolutely worse, then I think we should look for that. Um, and which brings me actually to, to local council elections and, and Alex's. Um, question, which I think is a right, I think we have a bit forgotten how bad the council election results were. Um, 
it's always the case, I think, when you have a set of council election results, it's quite unfair in many ways to local government because people want to interpret it as to what it means for the general election whenever it may be coming. Whereas sometimes a set of council election results just do reflect what people feel about a local um, situation. And I think there's real questions to be asked about why, why we didn't succeed. But I suspect that local authorities in labour areas have had such a terrible time. The most of our local labour leaders have become incredibly good at explaining to people what's going on and how they um, are trying to, the best they can, protect people. But nonetheless, these are very hard decisions. So what should we do? Well, I'm, I'm conscious, actually, of um, a campaigning experience I had in Cheshire Western Chester, which is the next door local authority area to me. And they had very much tried to show leadership on talking to people about the funding situation they faced. Um, they have been excellent communicators and very engaging. And I think we should look to examples like that. You, there's, there's no easy way around this. You just have to talk to people. You just have to be relentless in your message and keep campaigning. Um, you, I remember Steve Reed, who's now an MP with me, but when he was leader of Lambeth, and after he won Lambeth in 2006, and we in Southwark, where I was at the time, didn't win, I ran that campaign, it was my fault. Uh, sorry to everyone who was there. But anyway, Steve came to talk to us about you know, how they won and what the lessons were, and he said, however tired you are, however much you feel, you just can't do this. You've just got to keep on. Just keep knocking the doors, just keep talking to people, keep delivering the message, and in the end, that will get us through, and I think he's probably right. Um, and finally, on um, Hugh um, uh, from Bosworth, Look, it, it, oh, sorry, I don't know where he's from. <laughs> I've never seen him here before. Anyway, Hugh. Um, if you can't see him, by the way, he's got a fake national <laughs> And a large fedora. Um, you know, things may be tricky, and we all have difficult uh, party meetings at times. It is never the best when people have rows at Labour Party meetings. It is much more preferable, as in the general election, if, you know, if we can all kind of club in together and just get on with it and try and learn from each other rather than, rather than kind of throw rocks at each other. But what do you do when you're made to feel unwelcome is basically the, the question. And the first thing I would say is find somewhere that you do feel welcome, and I hope everybody who's come here today feels welcome. Yeah? <laughs> Good. And, and, and the second thing, I think, is just persist in, in what you think is right. Um, you know, we all have times where, and in response to this general election, I wasn't at all sure that we were going to get a big turnout amongst young people, even though that's what the polls were saying, but we did. I don't understand it yet. I'm going to need to do a lot of thinking about it. But it's kind of knocked one of the things that I thought was true about politics. And I'm OK about admitting that, and I'm going to think about it some more. But there are certain things in politics that I will never give up on. One of those things, um, as Charlotte was just saying, is trying to make people better off who need the money. Another of those things is involving people, no matter who they are. And those things will never change. So it doesn't matter to me if people have a go at me or whatever, I know what I believe in and I'll just stick with it. And I would just encourage everybody else to do the same. If you believe something about politics, just stick with it. Great. I think we've got just enough time for one final round of uh, questions now. Um, if we could go to the one man over here at the... Yep. Um, <clears throat> my name is Prashanta from Hammersmith. It's just a question uh, generally about how, how can we better hold the Tories to account on their terrible economic record? Because everyone knows over the last seven years, um, in, you know, including people you know, who vote Tory, uh, everyone knows that um, public services have been slashed. But many people think it was a many people have fallen for the Tory line that this was a necessary measure to fix our public services. Word doesn't seem to have got out with vast waves of the general population that the deficit hasn't come down enough, debt has increased, growth has been disappointing. 
as a party, I don't think we've gotten that message out to the public. How do we better hold the Tories to account, not just on the fact that everyone knows, you know, our NHS is in dire straits, our security service is in dire straits, but that they haven't even completed the agenda that they set out to do, uh, what, what they sold to us as the reasons they needed to do that and actually bring our public finances back into order. Thank you. Um, and if we just go in the middle here. Some... <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you. My name is Abdi from Ealing North. Um, just a quick question on Brexit because it's so fun. Um, in, in a lot of Remain seats in London, the phenomenon that we found or the trait that we found was a lot of Leave voters were more worried about domestic issues rather than actually Brexit. So actually when you raised, you know, except for the very philosophical, you know, um, Leave voter who, you know, memorised everything. Um, but the majority of them would talk to you about the NHS and local services. That's something that was mirrored in places like Wirral and were people more concerned about domestic things rather than Brexit, actually. Great, thank you. Uh, and one more. Uh, if we could go right to the back over there. Yeah. Hi, just um, talking here about personal experience. Um, before, I just used to be mocked on the streets, when I knocked on doors, or mocked by colleagues or friends or whatever for having Ed Miliband as my leader. Um, having the past two years of having Jeremy Corbyn, people have just been quite nasty. Um, but what I'm picking up, really, is a lot of people just seem to be trying to give credit to Jeremy Corbyn over the election. And this is what's getting me really angry, is that, to me, the, the contribution that Jeremy Corbyn made towards the election um, was we had a, have a manifesto, um, which to me was just infuriating, because there we are, promising tuition fees to, to rich students, to middle-class students who don't need the money, when if we could have raised that money, it could have gone elsewhere. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah. Basically, tuition fees are our pet project in the same way that grammar schools are the Tory pet project. Basically, we mirror the Tories. They say that I'm the one that's mirroring the Tories. No, it's the hard left who are taking over the party. They're the ones that mirror the Tories. And they're the ones that are also propping up Jeremy Corbyn, who's, um, who's very much in favour of Brexit. Well, let's just remember, a lot of the people who did vote for us voted for us because they're against Brexit. So that's really the contribution he's made. Now, where the real contribution is, it's in the fact that we've got such fantastic MPs. People wanted their fantastic Labour MPs. They didn't want Jeremy Corbyn. They wanted the great MPs. And I also have to pay credit to the great campaign organisers and people like myself who were involved. I mean, I'm not going to give myself credit for the hard work I did, but the fact <laughs> that no, I but actually... We but actually, what... What I did, as in, in my area, I was one of the ones who made the decision that Jeremy Corbyn was not going to come to our area to come and visit, and he was not going to come on our campaign literature. So that's where the really contribution is. It's the, we've got fantastic, hard-working activists. They're the ones who are really doing the work. They're the ones who, who actually achieve what we did achieve. Um, but, what, but what really hurts is that when you get a PLP who go and give Jeremy Corbyn standing ovations, now I'm sorry, I'm a working class, moderate member. I don't really feel welcome in this party anymore because, because what you said is that you want the, the bullying hard left. You want them in charge of the party and not people like me anymore. So basically, I would just like to please appeal to the PLP. Just address that issue. Thank you. Okay. Sometimes it's not always necessary for a question to need an answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, shall, but, we start, shall we start on holding the Tories to account in their economic record? Oh, Is it about oh making goodness. people read Mark Carney speeches? <laughs> I, if more people read Mark Carney speeches, it might not do many things, but I would be happy. But, <laughs> but look, I'm, I have spent seven years shouting at the Tory front bench on the economy. They've got it wrong again and again and again. Osborne reversed his plan in 2012. He caused a recession, reversed his plan, basically deferred to the Bulls plan effectively, and that got them through to the election. Now we face massive headwinds to our economy, and we've still not dealt with the problem that was caused by the financial crisis. So, you're kind of pushing at an open door with me. 
If your question is, don't the public see it? I, yeah, well, if, if I'm honest, I think that you can try and come up with clever political ways to explain this to people, but I think the public do understand what's happened, and I think that they do get that the Tories have failed. The question in their mind is whether a Labour government is the right way to fix it. And that's where our attention has got to be. And then I com would come back to what I said before about get the eco economics right and that will be good politics. Um, Abdi, on um, leave voters and um, what, what do they really care about? Um, I'll just say two things to you. Um, when I spoke to a lot of Leave voters, um, it, my constituency voted Remain, but only marginally so, so there's plenty of Leave voters around me. And lots of them told me that they voted Leave for two reasons. Firstly, because they thought David Cameron would have to resign if he lost, and they wanted to get rid of David Cameron, and they did. And secondly, because they thought we could have the money from the European Union and spend it on the NHS because Boris put it on a bus and they thought, well, Labour wouldn't be allowed to say it if that wasn't true. So actually, I think that Leave voters are, it's not that they don't care about the European Union or whatever, but I think their priorities are in many ways quite close to our hearts as well, which is why we should focus on delivering for people what they actually want. So almost all of the polls say that people want tariff-free trade, they want access to markets as we have now. Well, that's the single market. So let's just focus on what people want and I think we'll get through. Um, and finally, just on the, on the point that was made, which, you know, the lady at the back there expressed herself um, very well. You know, in the end, in this election, there, there are some people who really loved what Jeremy Corbyn had to say and they wanted to vote to support him. There are some people who felt the absolute and diametric opposite. And so it would be easy to say, well, there's just one reason why we, we won in the places that we did, um, and never mind the places that we lost. But I think that would be the wrong approach. I think the first thing we have to do is try very hard to understand what people, what the British public have asked us to do and try and deliver for them. The second thing to do is to not forget that you know, people will have different opinions all the time, but underneath it all, we do have a lot in common and we can bring the country together. And that finally, if we as a Labour Party do the historic job that we have always done, which is to make the voices of ordinary people in Britain heard loud and clear, then I think we'll win. Brilliant, thank you. We've got a, a series of breakout sessions for you now, but uh, I think we can all enjoy the new open progress politics with members holding the chair to account. <laughs> so thank you very much, Alison.